Hi, and welcome to Macro Monday, where we talk macro and try to make sense of a bond market that trades like a tech stock in the last 90 minutes. Try <laughs> so it doesn't make any sense to me. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. Uh, we're going to talk about the yield, con- I hate this, yield curve control, which, as I said, is not going to happen. We'll see that um, in a Fed speech today. I'm going to show you the part uh, where the vice chair, Claridia, went through that. And then we're going to do a monetary experiment. That's right. We're going to try to figure out the answer to the age old question is quantitative easing or a Fed increasing its balance sheet inflationary if we're not really sure. What does it mean for interest rates? What does it mean for the dollar? Now, a couple of sense of question is, Steve, well, I, I, I miss your old office. I assure you it is still there. But in your Eagle Scout stuff, it is still on the wall. Uh, what I what this does is it now hides the water stained ceiling, which I now know is because it's summer and very hot where I'm at. The air conditioner, the, the drain was actually going underneath the roof tiles, and my office happens to be directly above that drain, so it was just going through here. Landlord saw him today, not really a priority to get that painted, and the wood panel is not coming down. I don't own the office, so there's really no point in spending money on it. Uh, But I do own the logo, so I got the banner, and that's pretty cool. It's not as cool as the Royal Watermark, but let's get into what's going on with the yield control curve. I I have trouble saying that. So today, in a speech by Vice Chair Richard Clarita at the Peterson Institute for International Economics in Washington, D.C., via webcast, he talked about Federal Reserve's new monetary policy framework, a robust evolution. Yeah, okay. Uh, we could skip through all of that because there's really nothing of interest until he gets to his concluding thoughts. I will read it to you. It says, with regard to other monetary pol- policy tools, so he's referring to uh, not the federal funds rate and not quantitative easing. And as we have made clear previously in the minutes of our October 2019 FOMC meeting, we do not see negative policy rates as an attractive policy option in the U.S. context. Now, what does he mean by that? Is he referring to the federal funds rate, the treasury yield curve, all of the above? They're referring to the federal funds rate. Remember, the Fed does not have specific control over the yield curve. What do I mean the yield curve? I mean the yields for 2, 5, 10, 30 years. They, 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 they don't have control of it. They lost control of that back in the 80s. If you don't believe me, there's a great paper written by the St. Louis Fed on that. So they're saying, okay, we don't see the negative federal fund rate. All right, I, I, as I've told you, I'm not going to see that. As for targeting the yield curve, which everybody thinks they need to do, because they think interest rates are headed higher. Our general view is that with credible forward guidance and asset purchases, keyword, I love this, credible forward guidance. I mean, isn't that great? He's pretty much saying, look, as long as we say this is gonna happen, it does, we have some credibility, but we really don't have any because nothing we've ever said has ever worked. I mean, this is great that he actually uses that word there. If I was him, I would have left it off. So with credible forward guidance and asset purchases, AKA quantitative easing, the potential benefits from such an approach may be modest. So they're saying, look, we don't think that yield curve control will do anything or do very much. At the same time, the approach brings complications. Oh, in terms of implementation, translation, it ain't easy to do and communications. So how do we communicate what we're doing? And by the way, it's really difficult and we don't think it's gonna do much. Now, if you can't read into that, that they're not gonna do it, I'm not sure how to, what to tell you. Hence, as noted in the minutes from our previous meeting of July, 2020, most of my colleagues judged that yield caps and targets were not warranted in the current environment. There you go, not going to do it. But just to make sure you think that they might do it someday, but should remain an option that the committee could reassess in the future if circumstances change markedly. So here's the bottom line. Not going to do it, but just to keep your hopes up, we'll leave it on the table as a potential option that just so you know, we're never going to do unless things are really, really bad. Again, yield caps are meant to bring yields up, not to bring them down. They don't really need to bring interest rates down. Now, over the weekend, 
And kind of going into last week, there was a big discussion on Twitter. Uh, many of you probably followed it or a part of it, and I, and I love it. And you, you commented in the videos, and I tried to get to as many of them as I could. So what is this, is this QE thing? Inflationary? Is it not inflationary? So let, let's just zoom back and look at what's what. The vast majority of people believe the Fed is printing money. A small number of people believe the Fed by law can't print money, but is cheating the system. Some people believe they have evidence of it. Some people aren't really certain about it, but are pretty, but believe it if it was true. And then there's a very small number of people, that would be me, who think everybody else is wrong and can prove that and has been proving it and has can say, look at all this other evidence. But there are details that we don't have answers to, and we're still working on trying to get them and piece the puzzle together. It's complicated machinery. But you know, in chemistry class, which I did not like or do very well in, you would learn that if you're not sure what something is, you can run some tests to find out exactly that. So today we're going to do a very, very basic, say high school or entry level college class on is QE really inflationary? Does it really do anything that people talk about? And the answer is going to, I'll just give you the answer up front. It's not, it do, doesn't. And this is one of the things I struggle with when I hear, you know, see, and, and I'm, I'm not just trying to disparage you from comments, but when I see people make comments or people on YouTube post of, it's like, have you looked beyond just your opinion? I mean, have you put a chart together? Have you done any investigation into what your view is? Because what is inflation? Now, I know the answer, okay, oh, see if I got that one. It's, it's the expansion of the money supply. Okay, how does the money supply expand? Oh, well, the M2, how does the M2 expand? It comes from fr a fractional reserve banking system when people do what? <gasps> Borrow money, right? So when people borrow money, money is created in the system. Now, what is a rising M2 in conjunction with lending growth? It's evidence of inflation. What is a, ri what is a rising consumer price index in conjunction with lending growth? Evidence. It's evidence of inflation. What are higher interest rates? Evidence of inflation. You go, well, wait, wait. Look, if, if, if you're not convinced about that, <laughs> let me tell you what. Go back to the 1980s and look at what mortgage rates were and look at what they're at to now. That, there you go, early 80s, inflation, double digit mortgage rates. So we know that high interest rates are a symptom of inflation because why think of interest rates as a sponge when there is a more currency expanding in the system it acts like a sponge to soak up that money or a mop trying to soak it up well how does it do it they rise to get people to do what stop borrowing right if if you're in the market to buy a home or something right now and let's say tomorrow mortgage rates are to 10 percent do you think you're going to be buying a home Probably not. Now, of course, you're going to say, well, that means home prices might crash. Okay, well, forgetting, assuming the home prices stayed the same, are you going to go borrow money at 10%? No. What do you do? You put it in the bank or do something else. Probably put it in the bank. That's what high interest rates do. So we can see these things going on in the market. And what, what's weird to me is people have these views and they don't run basic chemistry tests, right? The professor says, hey, on your desk today is some something in a cup. You have till the end of the period to identify what it is and give me five evidence, proof, you know, run five, at least five tests to prove to me it is what you say it is. But everyone just goes, oh, I know exactly what that is. It's a, it's a cup full of inflation. Did you run some tests? Let's run some tests. I think it's fun. Now, how do we do, how, what's the easiest way to look at this? Well, we can go to the monetary base because everybody seems to agree with that when the Fed does its shenanigans, right? Quantitative easing, repo operations, currency swaps, and you know, whatever junk that it calls, whatever it's doing, it, it shows up in the monetary base. And we know that for a fact because the Fed has control over, the, over increasing and decreasing the monetary base. And everybody believes a rising monetary base is inflationary. That's the general view, except for me and a few other people, small number of very loyal, tight-knit people who don't believe that. 
Now, if we zoom into the monetary base, there's two parts of it. There's total balances maintained. This is the part we care about and currency and circulation. Look, I, I'm not really concerned about the, you know, the dollars in you know, bills or coins in your pocket. This, t this grows over time. It's not something of a concern. So we're gonna zoom in and look at total balances maintained. And what I have done, so total balance, balances maintained is in blue. I've overlaid 30 year treasury yield. Now, if we look, we can see the Fed's balance sheet is approximately back near its 2014, 2015 peak. At that time, 30 year treasury yields. Now, why did I pick 30 year treasury yields? It's because they're more volatile than any other part of the curve. And where did we see treasury yields in red? Well, they're somewhere, you know, around, you know, three plus percent. They're at one and a half. So the Fed's balance sheet is where it was in 2014, and interest rates are half of what they were. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. As a monetary scientist, I must dig deeper. So I say, hmm, this doesn't look right. Maybe if I invert treasury yields. Oh, hey, look at that. What does it tell me? It, now, it's not a perfect relationship. It is not correlated, as my wife would say. She says, don't use that word. It's not correlated. Use relationship. And it doesn't have a direct transmission. There are lags when the Fed does things. There are other things going on in the economy that can create lags. And monetary policy does have lags. But it certainly looks like to me that when I invert 30-year treasury yields against the monetary base, that lo and behold, it explains that as the Fed increases its monetary base, it is more likely that interest rates are going to fall than rise. And if not that sometime in the very, very near future, shouldn't 30-year treasury yields be at 3% plus? Shouldn't there just be annihilation in the bond market? Some of you, oh yeah, I can't wait for that. That's exactly what's going to happen. But this chart says, no, the opposite is going to happen. Let's, how about the dollar? Oh, the dollar is going to zero. It's going to, go, it's going to crash. It's going to go to 70s, 60s, 50s. No one's going to want dollars. But when you take that same monetary base chart, and you run it against the trade weighted dollar. And I went back and you'll notice all these dates are across all the charts are the same. It certainly looks like to me that over time, as the monetary base increases, the dollar increases. Yet everybody says the dollar is headed lower and the Fed's balance sheet is headed higher. And I've been saying, look, the dollar goes up. You can see here, the balance sheet went up, the dollar lagged and went up. It's inevitable, it's going to go higher. And so even if you're not sure about something, you can look at the data and run some relationships and try to figure out, does this make sense? So why, why did I know with, with a high degree of accuracy, we were not going to get yield curve control because we don't need it. We don't need it. That's what quantitative easing does. It's designed to suppress interest rates. I mean, does it make sense to you that when the federal, when the federal Fed lowers the federal funds rate, right? You go, okay, I know that lowers short-term interest rates. Why would they lower short-term interest rates and at the same time raise long-term rates? Because that's what everyone thinks is happening. Why would they do that? Are they trying to get everybody to borrow at short-term rates, get your mortgage, you know, refi it down to a, you know, 24-month loan, 12-month loan on short-term rates? Does that, does that make any sense? How, how would that spur people to go make large purchases where money is created? You know, if I went down to an electronics store and bought a TV, you know, what, what do TVs cost? You know, now they're fairly inexpensive. Let's say I bought a $1,000 TV and I put it on credit. $1,000 is generated in the economy. Whether I swipe it as a credit card or, buy, or get a loan, it creates money in the economy. Wouldn't more money be created if I went out and, say, bought a half a million dollar home or a $100,000 car? Am I going to buy an expensive car or an expensive home? Of course, that could be relative where you live, right? I mean, some of you are like, man, I live in LA and bear it. Half, half a million is a bargain. How, okay, million and a half for you. Two million. Doesn't matter. If I'm looking to create credit and inflation, what do I need as a central banker? I need people to borrow money and I need them to borrow big ticket items. Now, do I get people to borrow and buy big ticket items when long-term rates are higher and short-term rates are lower? Nope, nope, no, no, does not. It doesn't even make logical sense. That's why QE brings rates down to get people to borrow money. It just has 
of unintended effect of tightening financial conditions. You know, another thing that people do is they say, well, well, Steve, don't you know that the low interest rates, stock prices go up? Really? Really, really, really? Okay. And again, and I get, I get questions about this. I get emails about it. And I'm like, do people ever run charts? Run chart before you email me. See if you can figure it out. Try it. Learn. I mean, I, I, you know, it's not that I don't mind trying to help, help you answer questions. I want you to learn and, and, and be a monetary scientist. So here is 13-week treasury. It's the closest thing to the federal fund rate. And look, why, can you tell me why did yields go down and the stock market go down? If falling yields is bullish for stock prices, why didn't stock prices go up? And why didn't they go here? Yields went down. How, how could it have happened twice? It's not supposed to do this, right? I was told lower interest rates mean high stock prices, but it's very clear. Interest rates went down, stock prices went down. Hey, look what happened here. Interest rates went down, stock prices went down. It, does it make sense that you've got to be a monetary scientist? You've got to, you know, instead of just, you know, kicking the dirt with your foot, get a shovel out, do some digging. I mean, you can look at it in relationship. You can see it in the tenure. See, tenure goes down, stock price go down. Tenure go down, stock price go down. 10 year go down, stocks went down. 10 years gonna go down again because of QE, but this time stock prices are gonna go up. Hmm, don't know about that. All right, let's take a look at how hedge fund managers are positioned. Now, even though this data is lagged because it's from Tuesday of last week, it just shows positioning. And that's kind of what I wanna see is, is where's is everyone at? Now on the 10 year, Hedge fund managers are slightly long, not a really big deal, but look at the 30, they, they backed off. It's like, this is not a big deal. They're still massively net short. Why? Because here you, you see that belief that QE causes long-term rates to go up. And it doesn't, it, there's no evidence to support that, none. Not a shred of evidence because if, the, if it was 30 year yields would not be one and a half percent with the nearest, you know, we're, we're sitting at pretty much the largest short speculative position in the 30 year bond. So you have all these people betting on rates going higher and they're still only at one and a half percent. And yet the monetary base right where it was 2014 doesn't make any sense. Well, it does if you actually believe that QE is deflationary. How about West Texas Intermediate? We're seeing the speculators back off a little bit. Uh, as crude starts to flatten out here, maybe losing some confidence, I don't know. Uh, we see speculators increasing their shorts on the S&P, betting on a big move, starting to bet on a move down. Uh, the, the Euro tra uh, trade opposite the dollar, extending their long position. So bets against the trade weighted dollar are getting higher. That's going to get massively reduced, reversed, and uh, that will support my Again, my long-term dollar bullish view that we'll see a breakout over 103 on the DXY. Uh, gold, no real change there in the long positions. I still expect a reversal in gold when the dollar breaks out. Uh, NASDAQ longs largely unchanged. How about small caps? Slight increase in small caps that are not really leading the large caps higher. They normally do lead the mark large caps. So keep an eye on small caps. Uh, US dollar short chain uh, positions unchanged but the market is very bearish on the dollar. How can it work out? How about the VIX? Still no real major change. Market still betting on uh, volatility suppression. Try overlaying the monetary base with that. You'll see that an increase in the Fed's balance sheet does lead to increased volatility. Let's take a quick look at what's going on in the bond market today because for a while, for a while, I thought, you know, as we saw the, the treasury bears drove it down to 45 yard line right before we had an intermission. And then today, out of the gate, boom, it looks like things were taken off. And I thought maybe there's a turnover. And when you're, look, when, when you're a bear, when you're a treasury bear, and your offense has the ball, you know that they're going to fumble at some point. I mean, any Bears fan knows a fumble is coming because they've been a Bears fan for a long time. It's just going to happen. Maybe they get the ball back, but it, you, you're, it's going to happen. And then all of a sudden, look at this wild roller coaster trading right around, right at 1130. All of a sudden, mass. I mean, I mean, I thought there was a fumble because this thing was just driving higher, higher, higher. And all of a sudden, whoa, and then, OK, and then no. And then this weird coiling pattern. And OK, I, I this is not normal what you see in a bond market. I have no explanation for it. Maybe in the days of fall, we will. Uh, the question then is, is this turnover? Are we seeing now 
Yeah, who knows? Maybe this is the both sides scrambling for the ball. I don't know. We don't know. But if this is a bottom and turnover, well, what we're looking for is a breakout, which would be equiv equivalent to 1.2% on the third year, which is right up in here. And uh, the next time it knocks on the door, it won't get stopped. The defense will be tired out. So with that, I appreciate you taking the time to watch. I do enjoy your comments. I try to get to as many of them as I can. Be sure to like. If you are new, like, subscribe. We like having you here. Love hearing what your feedback is. Join us on Twitter, wherever you're at. And we'll be back to on Wednesday, not tomorrow, on Wednesday, to see. Maybe we have some economic data to go through and uh, see what's going on in the bond markets. I'm your host, the Bond King, Steve Admeter. Thanks for joining me today. Bye now. The content of this video is provided as educational information only and not intended to provide investment or other advice. This show is not to be construed as a recognition or solicitation by our social security, financial arrangement, or participate in a particular trading strategy. This video was paired by Steve Admeter. Personal capacity, pitch express this video that I do not reflect the view of Atlas Financial Advising or Steve Admeter Financial.